Okay. Yes. So y'all eat all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, from one end to the other, yes. <laughs> from the rooter to the tutor, right? From That's right. I didn't want to say that. Tutors. That was my dad saying, but no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what the rooter and the tutor are. <laughs> I guess I know. It's I supposed to be the head to the tail. The rooter is the nose. Okay, because that's what the they nose. would dig in the ground with. Uh, okay. those, uh, that's how yeah. you get your truffles and Oh, you know, great. So, okay. So we are good and live here. Um, I see, Wendy, I think I still see you not muted as a, um, I'm going to hide non-participant video. So here we are. Looks like the stream is working. Um, all of us are here today, Rick, in that beautiful, lovely background in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm jealous. <laughs> and it's um, snowing. It's, it's snowing. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. So, well, welcome. Uh, you know, I'm saying welcome to those who may be watching this live on uh, our Facebook, um, our Family Search Facebook Live or via YouTube. My name's Tom Reed. I'm a Deputy Chief Genealogical Officer with Family Search International. And I am going to, Wendy has been crazy enough to allow me to kind of host today. Uh, with several of my friends, my genealogy friends and buddies uh, today as we talk about African-American genealogical societies and organizations and their connections and things they're doing for their members as well as for Black History Month. So let me go ahead and introduce this illustrious panel of people. I'm going to go alphabetical by last name. So I show no bias except I like B's first. So Marie. Bryant is coming to us from Los Angeles, California as the president of the California African American Genealogical Society. Marie, introduce yourself to our to the people. Well, I think you've done that. Um, <clears throat> I got interested in genealogy in the 90s when um, we were burying one of our great aunts and in talking to my siblings, I realized they did not know the people that I knew because mm. they are younger. Okay. And um, so then I started um, saying that I needed to do something about that to make them acquainted or introduce my siblings to the people that I knew. And then that just started everything tumbling because once you find one person, then it goes sure. on to the next and next. You started so, um, yeah, I, I uh, have enjoyed. So I went searching mm -hmm. for uh, someone or some place that could help me. And I saw a flyer one day in a library uh, that the, California African American Genealogical Society was having a one day conference. Okay. So, as they say, I paid my $10 and I went. Mm -hmm. And I have been with them ever since. Um, and I invite all others in the Los Angeles community to uh, check us out, check our website, um, and uh, join us. Because of the pandemic, we are doing like you are doing. Mm -hmm. We have our, our meetings, which is the third Saturdays of the month, uh, via Zoom. Uh, we had just restarted our um, writers group uh, because uh, it shut down because of the pandemic, because we were meeting in, uh, in person, in person. Okay. but uh, we just started. So that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to, you know, you, you said you were from Texas a little earlier as we were getting started. Yes. I want to acknowledge some of the people that are tuning in. We've got folks from Denver or from uh, Delaware, from Illinois, my old stomping ground, even Florida and England. At least that, oh, that's just a couple. So if you're watching, we want to know where you're from. Please throw in the comments and we'll, we'll give you a little location, a little shout out. So now we're gonna go over, we're moving from California to the other coast, South Carolina. And we're going to our good friend, Tony Carrier, who is the director for the Center for Family History at the International African American Museum. 
Welcome, Tony. Tony, how you doing? Thank you. Hello. Hello, friends. Um, it's great to be here. Doing well. It's Black History Month. How could I not be? That's right. That's right. <laughs> lot, lot, I know you got a lot of stuff going on. I talked to you <laughs> earlier about some of the big projects you've been working on and pulling all multiple all-nighters and stuff like that. So yes. we'd love to hear about that and, and hear about what's going on at IAAM in, in just a moment. So thank you, Tony from South Carolina. Any others checking in? We've got actually someone who's, call, who's uh, watching today from Ghana. Another person who is coming from North Carolina, so just up above you there, Tony. Uh, and, and like I said, Florida, we got some, some good folks in Florida that are watching and tuning in. What about some people in Virginia? Rick, you got any, fan, any folks that should be tuning in from Virginia or where, where are you coming from? I got folks from all over the country, so I'm hoping my peeps have, have, have tuned in to listen to us. Um, I'm living in the uh, DC metro area, what they call DMV. District, Maryland, Virginia, originally from the Boston area, um, and can't wait to share new things with you guys. Well, thank you. Rick is the Vice President of History for the Afro-American Genealogical and Historical Society. Uh, we call it AUGS, and I literally just said the acronym backwards. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. I know better. Rick didn't call me out. But and actually, the, form, the former VP. Former VP uh, of history. Yes, the former, the former VP. They gave me the opportunity to not to run, so I'm very happy about that because <laughs> I'm doing some other new things along with, with uh, Nika, so we'll share with you a little bit later on. Oh yeah, I'm excited. I know you, you've had you published some books recently and, and, and got some other things on the horizon. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited for our people to hear about it. So next is Miss Nika Smith. How you, Nika Sewell Smith. I'm sorry that I did not use the hyphenated point. I just always call you Nika Smith. So you, you can explain either one, but you're coming to us today. You, you are a woman of many talents, but you just put your title today as planning committee for the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective, which is just one of the various organizations I know you're involved in. So Nika, how, how are you doing today? I am good. Um, it's still in the land of living, you know? We are good, healthy. Um, we're supposed to get a snowstorm down here right outside of Memphis. So, you know, the you know usual, oh gosh, go to the store and get your bread and your eggs. You know, that is currently <laughs> happening around me. It's a frenzy. Um, yeah, I'm good. I'm excited to talk about what we've been doing with the collective. Um, it's such an a undertold story of Black history, in particular during Black History Month. So yes. I'm super excited to, to talk about that today. Well, thank you, Nika, and thank all of you. The, re the reason I kind of have brought you all together, if you will, is because you do all represent somewhat different societies and groups when it comes to African-American genealogy. So Nika, you just talked about the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective. And I think of that more as a um, kind of ethnic and, and really focused group versus, you know, someone like the California African American Genealogical Society, very localized, but broad in African American genealogical research. OGS obviously is broad because of all the chapters that are around the nation and the different, you know, groups that, that meet in the name of OGS. And because so I consider them kind of the national organization that's out there. And then Tony represents something unique in terms of an actual physical space being built and, and creating a, a center for family history there in Charleston at the International African American Museum and providing a lot of resources to the community there, but also broadly as well. Now that there's a couple more, you know, I, I, I I, I felt bad because there's a couple more that I would love to have included in this group. So my friends, for example, at the Midwest African American Genealogical Institute, Maggie, as they're known, is the- I the, can stand uh, proxy. You can I can stand, stand proxy. proxy. Maggie. <laughs> you can stand proxy, can proxy for Maggie. <laughs> stand proxy for Maggie. And then we also have like for a lineage society, the only one that, that's for those of documented enslaved African ancestry and the sons and daughters of the United States Middle Passage. I can stand proxy for them too. Now we probably for <laughs> that organization as well. So we don't have we can just... from them. Right. There's, there's just, so, right. but what I, I, I say this to just let, let our viewers know and people know there's so much out there that, that you can be involved in and connect with. You know, this is Black History Month and we are taking, you know, time during this month to shine a spotlight on the contributions of Black Americans 
which is not limited to 300, you know, to, to 30, 28 days, 29 days last year, but it's something that's 365 days. But I wanted to bring you all in here because you provide some unique resources for those who are trying to find their own personal story amongst the Black history narrative and, and in the context of history and those who've made contributions to this country. And so I, I wanna, first of all, applaud you and thank you for the work that you're doing in the various spaces and the many hats that you wear because it is so needed. Um, our people are searching, I feel a hunger and a thirst, you know, as, as Alex Haley talked about, like, you know, a hunger and a thirst marrow deep to know who we are and where we've come from. And you are helping satisfy that hunger through your organizations and what you provide. And so, so tell us, let, let's start off and just ask a question of kind of what is the role of genealogical societies and, and groups and, and particularly what you're involved in. And let, I'll go kind of now by pictures on my screen. Tony, what, what, what do you kind of, what do you think about that in terms of the roles of groups and how they can play and, and help people discover and connect with their families? Right. Oh, goodness. There's just so much that, that groups can do to move your genealogy forward and also to, um, to really give you a community that shares an interest with you. Um, but I think um, groups and societies, um, what we do in general, it's a, it's a gathering place. It's a place for people to come together and share what they're looking for. Um, I think one of the primary benefits of some of the research group, uh, groups that we have on Facebook is simply that people start helping each other. Mm -hmm. And you have this, this enormous depth of um, experience when you get a group of people who have been researching their genealogy for years and years, when you get those people together, it's like they say, all of us are smarter than any single one of us. Mm -hmm. And so what we see a lot in our research groups is people helping each other before we even see the query on Facebook, five people may have popped in and said, oh, you might try this, or I found that. So there's just so much that, that um, being involved in, a, in an organization or being involved in a research group can do for you. That's great. Marie, you talked about, you know, seeing that flyer and, and join and then, you know, paying your $10 and being connected. How, how has being a part of an African-American genealogical society helped you personally in your research? Well, it has shown me how to do research because that's our mission. Uh, we find that when we get uh, younger people coming in and then we, you know, they think that everything they can do over their phone. Everything is online. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are sorely dis and, and we they're sorely disappointed when they find it's not and they want to know why. And then we just explain to them there is someone has to go out to these resources and they have to film, they have to re record, they have to do the transcribing in order for you to be able to see it. Right. Um, and I, I've also found that some of my ancestors don't want to be, seem to not want to be found. They <laughs> <I'm elusive. laughs> They're kind of ducking and dodging. Yes, you know? yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's a different kind of euphoria when you do find someone. Uh, yes. We've made several trips to your city there in uh, Salt Lake uh, to the family history, <laughs> to, to the family library there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just when some of our members, this, this big uh, smile comes on their face when they have found this elusive person that they've probably been uh, looking for for 15, 20 years, uh, yeah. maybe even longer. Yeah. So, um, and I love the, as um, Tony mentioned, the camaraderie mm -hmm. that, because we have members that are uh, in Louisiana, New York, okay. um, Texas, and we all share the same um, connecting. And we've also, since we've been doing this research, I have not found anyone uh, in our society, but we've, some of our members 
through their DNA, and we'll get, I know we'll get to that later, but it just, oh, yes. it just came to me that they are related. Although right now they can't find out how, they can't right. find that common, common person. But uh, it's, it's really just exciting. It can be disappointing, yeah. uh, but, it's, sure. but sure. Uh, the excitement outweighs all of the disappointments, I think, when you found That's something. True. It is exciting. And I know, Rick, it's, it's been exciting probably for you, particularly last year when we really shined a light on 1619 and the arrival of the first documented Africans in British North America, for you to kind of do a homecoming and connect with others who are descendants of those first 20 and odd, so to speak. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about what Augs has done to bring those people together or to, to, and what Augs does as a society actually in, in bringing people together and helping? I know you do conferences, for example, we participated in. So I'd love to hear you kind of speak about that. Well, Augs is the, the, the Afro-American Historical Genealogical Society is the premier uh, historical and genealogical society for Americans of African descent. <clears throat> As you indicated earlier, we have chapters all over the country. Um, we've got thousands and thousands of members who bring their individual stories, their individual histories. Um, and, and I personally, I look at genealogy very differently. I look at it through the lens of history and genealogy and for Americans of African descent, we have to realize that our history was taken from us, but also through that history, our families were divided and separated and sold and children taken away from parents. So when you look at the history and then tie it into the genealogy, it's so important for us to try to reunite with, with different parts of our family that was taken away. Mm -hmm. So when we look at 1619, um, and we're beginning to realize that so many of us are now able to make those connections to the 16 and 1700s. As valuable as that is, we're also beginning to realize the importance of our ancestors in terms of the formation of this country. Um, and many people don't realize that our free ancestors uh, worked the soil much like our enslaved ancestors but our enslaved ancestors were really the foundation for the nation's monetary system. So when you look at history and genealogy together, it just means so much more. And I think so many of us are now looking back and saying, had I known this when I was a younger person, I myself might've been a different person growing up. I might've been a different person as an adult. So history and genealogy now has taken a new meaning to us. And that's what 1619 was all about to correct a, a false national narrative in terms of who our ancestors were. And more important, as many of us are now doing genealogical research, we're beginning to find out that our ancestors are speaking to us because they want to be found and they want their stories to be told and they want us as descendants to understand their importance in life and how they really are true founders of this country. Okay, let's, let's just drop the mic in the broadcast now, I think. Rick summed it up so well. <laughs> Thank you, Rick, for that. That was great. Um, and and you, you talk about the ancestors now are speaking. And, and so Marie, I know you said there, there, some of them are elusive, but there are others that are, that are shouting from the rooftops to be found. And, and you know, all of us are doing our best to kind of help that happen. Nika, talk a little bit about this Oklahoma Freedman Collective and how maybe it's unique in the genealogy space in terms of how it's helping, you know, people connect. So with the collective, um, it's a particular story that, again, is something that just hardly ever gets mentioned in, in not just American history, but in African American history. I think a lot of us on the panel can agree that, you know, in the various societies and groups um, that we've been involved in over the years, there's always someone new that comes that is trying to verify this story of, an, of the Native American princess or is really, you know, connected to, you know, this narrative that has been passed down for generations in their family. And, you know, they're coming to the meeting to, you know, figure out how to verify that, right? Like yeah. we've seen that more commonly. Um, and, and in Marie's group, that, that actually shouldn't be odd because, you know, Freedmen of the Five Tribes, meaning the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Creek, Muscogee, um, and Seminole Nations, we move around in clusters. We're like an amoeba. And LA 
is one of the places that we all settle next to Oakland. So if someone came to Marie's meeting and said, oh, well, my folks were Choctaw, I'd be like, okay, that probably is right. Where, 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 do they, where are they from, right? And they would mention a place in, in Oklahoma. Literally, we know based on the city. Like that's how, that's how corralled this is. And so um, with that history, you know, we don't have to go on this, you know, 20, 30 year journey to find out who our ancestor slaveholders were. The names are right there clearly on the Dawes cards. That's a, that's a journey that freedmen, that's one of the benefits, I guess you would say of being a freedman, but there are sometimes, well, there's a lot of challenges with mm -hmm. our relationships with the nations as well, right? And so um, we, we have this sort of duality, right? Just how I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I'm also a citizen of the United States. We have parallel histories and parallel documents that exist for us. Um, and so, you know, I, I will go on record and say we are probably one of the most documented groups of Black people in the country, bar none, because we've got nation records and then we've got U.S. records. And so in some ways, we kind of fit into everyone's pockets. Freedmen are members of OGS. Freedmen are members of CAGS. Freedmen have a place in the in the museum in Charleston, and and you know again it's 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 really putting skin on the bones of this this story and ties to um to you know to the five tribes and um you know the amazing history and, and having the ancestors calling out you know it's there's mm -hmm. again just like there's no we don't have that sort of paradigm of I don't know who the slaveholder is we also have unique records where we hear our ancestors' voices, almost mm -hmm. very similar mm -hmm. to uh, the slave narratives, where mm -hmm. it's questions and answers. And you, 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 know, you see them on the stand talking to the people at the DOS Commission, and you're just hearing, you know, it's almost like you're in the room. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I love it. It's to me, it's like, you just can't beat the, you just can't beat the, you can't beat Friedman research, which is why, which is why Tony is nodding her head. Cause yes. if you just dip your toe in it a little bit, you're like, Oh, this is good. It's yeah, it's good. Well, well I, I appreciate that. And, and that is a kind of an interesting dynamic that I've come to learn over the year, you know, years of, of, of being in the genealogical community is about <laughs> that connection of native American and, and African American and how those two come together and how they play out. You know, I did have that story. I got my, you know, we got good hair because we got Indian in our family kind of thing. And my mom was like 164th Cherokee or something like that. Oh. Well, but but a lot of it is region, right? Like right. so many right. of us have been fed stories and, and and it may not necessarily be that your 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 ancestor wasn't Native American. It's mm -hmm. just that the, the nation that you're thinking it is, it may yep. not be that one. It right. may be another one or it might be, but your people are from Alabama. So right. that's totally possible, right? Totally, so, totally possible. Right. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, so we've got we've got some um, viewers that are, that are kind of commenting and throwing some things out there for us, and we invite anybody who's watching. If you have a question for any of us on the panel, anyone specifically, or, or anyone, please feel free to to chime in. We'd love to kind of answer your questions and respond to anything that's on your mind, in particular. Um, and, and so I ha we do have a uh, another just a question and this is I want you to put this again since you all represent these organizations and, and I want to be brief on this so we can get around to everyone is someone asked what are the recommendations for someone who is just getting started with African-American ancestors so I want to just hear one tip from each of you about what they can do to get started and maybe how your organization might be able to help so Tony let's let's take it from the top all let's right all right, I would say uh, start with the basics um, and avoid common mistakes. Um, there's a great video out there on YouTube uh, that Tony Burroughs recorded for Ancestry.com some years ago about avoiding 10 common mistakes in African-American genealogy. And it falls under the, if only I had known category. Sure. Um, so I would say avoid, if only I had known, I would have done this differently. Yeah, that, that's a good one. And, and hopefully our moderators that are that are helping us on this broadcast might be able to find that YouTube link to Tony Burroughs video on those 10 common mistakes or, or I, I wish I would have known kind of thing. Rick, what, what, what's one thing someone can get to do to get started in African American research? I started my uh, genealogical research in the late 70s. And it was a very unique opportunity um, for a number of reasons. Um, 
but what I came to learn the importance of collecting oral histories from the oldest people within the family. Okay. And what I found is in the 70s, I had a number of great aunts and great uncles who were in the 80s and 90s, and through their knowledge, was able to take me to the early 1800s. So that was invaluable information that certainly allowed me to do the in-depth uh, genealogical research. So clearly, um, my recommendation is do your oral history, your oral family history, and go to the oldest people in the family because they won't be around long. And once they're gone, that knowledge base is gone. So, okay. so your success is based on your knowledge, based on your elders, respect your elders. Okay, so we got, we got just don't make those common mistakes. Learn, learn what others have done and talk to the oldest living relative that you have and, and gain that information. That's amazing how far they were able to take your family back. Nika, what, what's another tip that you would give and just getting started with African-American research? I would say, don't neglect what you know in the, in the pursuit of, of rushing to get online to find out what's out there. Okay. Um, a lot of times people will make that rush to do that and neglect to search, you know, what we, what we call the home repository, right? You know, looking through even some of the most mundane records that people have lying around their homes or the homes of relatives, you know, and, okay. and, and, you know, it kind of fits in with, with what Rick just talked about with regard to interviewing elders, right? Mm -hmm. When you're doing those interviews, you also want those folks to entrust you with what they have that is related to your family, whether mm -hmm. it's funeral programs or obituaries or vital records or photos, right? You want to nurture those relationships so that they, you develop trust with those folks so that they know if they impart this information to you, you're going to do something with it and you're going to share what you find. And so um, the most powerful and most significant asset we have to our family history projects is our self, our knowledge and our, and our community. Um, whether that's blood relations or even fictive kin, you know, or as I like to say, your, your, your nosy aunt. Um, yep. You know, who's not really an aunt, but she's an aunt. That's my mom, um, right. you know, who can recount everybody's yep. life, can run it down, right? Yep. Oh, yep. no, she had that baby with so, you know, that's who you need to talk to before right. you run out online. And right. then you're confused because you didn't, yep. you didn't invest in those conversations with, with yourself and with your elders early on. So I think what I heard you say is that that home repository can be a gold mine as well as those relationships, as Rick said, and just make sure you, you, you know, don't follow those mistakes that most people do of running right online. I think even Marie, you said that earlier that people, you know, get disappointed and young folks come to help and, and they're like, well, everything's online. So what, what advice do you have for someone getting started? Just one quick tip we can share with our viewers. Well, I had to think of something else because uh, Rick thought of the first thing, Rick said the first thing that I thought about, mm -hmm. but also in, in interviewing, depending on the age of the person, don't ask direct questions because mm. they will tell you they don't know. Mm. Okay. I'm talking about something, somebody, maybe someone in their uh 80s, 90s, even 100, because we have a lot, still have a lot of those around. Mm -hmm. uh, I prefer, I learned going the route, the route of, do you remember your, what was your first day of school like? Mm. Mm -hmm. Then you can get into the, bring them up, up in age, and then you mm -hmm. can get into the meat of what you're really after. Sure. Okay. Uh, who was your best friend in school? Mm -hmm. Or did you, do you remember your first school dance or something like that? Because sure. if you just ask, you know, who was someone's, like Nika said, uh, father, they don't know. Mm -hmm. they, they may know. <laughs> they, but no, they, don't, they know, they don't, but they, they, they don't, they don't want to tell. And so they yes. don't know, right? Yes. Exactly. Yes. So the type yes. of questions you ask. Yeah, it's a direction that you take. Absolutely. Sometimes you have to go uh, left in order mm -hmm. to come back mm -hmm. to where you actually want to be. And, it's, mm -hmm. and it usually depends on the age of the person. Okay. Thank you for that. And thank you for answering that question. Um, we, we've got some resources hopefully we'll be able to put up in for those on, on Facebook. Um, 
live are, are seeing some of the resources and, and things and answers to that question as well. I want to give an opportunity for each of you to talk a little bit more about your organizations. We got a question specifically for you, Tony. Where is this museum that we're hearing about in South Carolina? So tell us a little bit more about the International African American Museum and the Center for Family History there. Sure. The International African American Museum is being developed in downtown Charleston, South Carolina, and it's one it's on one of our country's most sacred sites and that is Gadsden's Wharf. And the reason that Gadsden's Wharf is a sacred site um, in our country is that so many um, enslaved captive Africans were brought into Gadsden's Wharf in the international slave trade. As you know, Charleston was a major center in the international slave trade and Gadsden's Wharf was one of those places where so many enslaved Africans took their very first steps um, on American soil and um, into their uh, journey of lifelong enslavement. And so um, we will have a memorial garden beneath the museum. The museum is raised up in order to pay homage to the reverend site that's below. Um, and we will have a memorial garden below that's free to everyone without um, museum admission. Mm -hmm. The Center for Family History itself uh, will be a research center uh, within the museum when the museum opens in uh, the spring of 2022. Uh, but we are online now live. You can find mm -hmm. us at cfh.iaamuseum.org. And we have hundreds of um, historical documents archived there and many, many, many resources for your research as well as more than 180 blog posts about family history research, how to get started, and how to keep your research moving forward. Okay, thank you for that. Giving us just a little primer on what's happening. And you said spring 2022 in Charleston is where you'll be um, when, when the center opens. And I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited for our partnership and how we're working together as well. Um, Rick, why don't you tell us a couple of things that you, you said earlier, you and you and Mika had something that you wanted to share with us with the group. I don't know, y'all collaborated on something, but if, I, I want to give the floor to you for a moment to maybe talk about OGS or, or talk about some of the work that you're personally involved in right now that may be of interest to our viewers. Well, let me give a couple of sh shout outs. Um, I talked about OGS. Um, you know, as a, the premier organization, um, every year we have a national conference where we bring thousands of people from around the country, in fact, from around the world, to learn about uh, African American history and genealogy. Um, this year, like most organizations, we went virtual. Um, the upcoming year, 2021, will be a virtual conference again, the second week of October. Uh, we will have phenomenal speakers. Um, I know Nika was there last year. Tony, I don't know if you were a speaker there last year. Tom, you were a speaker. You had a very uh, 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 enlightening uh, panel. So we really do bring you know, premier speakers from around the country to try to answer the unique questions and challenges that people have in terms of doing the genealogical research, but also mm -hmm. understanding their people. Um, uh, Nika and I collaborated an awful lot of stuff um, I'm a board member of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage. Anika recently became uh, a member. Um, it's an organization that honors our enslaved ancestors. Um, we really need to begin to understand the historical importance of our ancestors who were enslaved. We need to honor their history and their memory. Um, and the Sons and Daughters does that. It's a lineage society. And we as people of color, as Americans of African descent, um, lineage societies is something new to us, but we mm -hmm. don't realize how important they are. Um, um, my mother was the first African-American woman of, uh, of Africa, the first woman of African descent who descended from an African-American in the Daughters of American Revolution back in 1983. Um, I'm the sons of the Sons of Revolution. I belong to a number of, of uh, lineage societies. And as a result of that, Anika, I, and, and a couple of other people realize the importance of honoring um, our ancestors who were the actual founders 
of English North America, and we're starting a new society. Um, so we will have a soft announcement this evening, and we will have a more formal announcement um, in May. Um, but there's going to be a national society for the first Africans in English America. Um, and we have a whole bunch of people waiting for the application to come out, the criteria to be announced. Um, and really it will be an organization that will really begin to emphasize the importance of our ancestors in the founding of English America. Um, wow. And when most people realize that um, half, of the, uh, the, half of the Africans who came to English America slash United States came prior to um, the mid 1700s. Um, and that was long before most European American ancestors came here. We really are founders in the country. And, and, and I quite frankly say we're the second indigenous people of the land because mm -hmm. not only did we come here, we, we, we built the land, we developed the land, we nurtured the land. Um, and the land was the foundation of the country through our labor. So this is going to be a phenomenal organization, cool. a large organization. A lot of people are excited about it. Um, and now we will have two lineage societies, the Sons and Daughters of the Middle Passage and the Society of the First Africans in English America, the Founders of America. Wow. You heard it first, y'all. Hopefully, this is this the first public thing you're talking about, this society? This is a soft announcement. This is soft, but I, I still want to take credit. No. You know, I, I had to, when I knew Dude, Nikki was going to be on this, we, we had to do this. So this is a soft announcement okay. because we're still working out some of the bugs, uh, sure, some of the sure. dates, some of the challenges, okay. getting the application ready, getting the website ready. Okay. Um, we have a phenomenal list of men and women who are already going to be our officers. Um, those names are under wraps for the time being. Okay. So uh, this is a soft announcement. Okay, thank you for sharing the, that though and sharing some of the organiza other organizations and what they do. So I'm gonna go back to you, Nika, and then, and then Marie, we'll, we'll touch base on, on CAGS, but Nika, o Oklahoma Freedmen Collective, can you kind of give us a, a nutshell of why you exist? I mean, you kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but but how do you operate? How do people connect with you and what do they get from being a part of this collective? I'm gonna read the official statement because hello, I'd be remiss if I did not. Okay. Um, through the collective, people become effective visual storytellers of their family stories, okay? The Freeman Collective is the authoritative clearinghouse of educators dedicated to genealogy, cultural exploration, and the recounting of Freedmen of the Five Tribes history. This is a unique pivot because there are organizations that exist to, you know, tell the story of Freedmen, but a lot of them um, are more um, politically sort of framed, right? Like advocating for rights of freedmen and things like that. They're, we're really the, the first organization that has been created that is specifically to address the history of the freedmen of the five tribes, right? Okay. And of okay. course, to, you know, to recapture that, Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole Nations. And as well, it's not just people who are freedmen of those tribes, it's also friends of folks or people who just have a general interest in that. Our right. mission is to educate five tribes freedmen, about methods of their learning their remarkable history. We empower freedmen to use technology to tell their stories. And we create avenues of communication among freedmen groups, communities, and organizations. And so the way that we do this is uh, we have monthly Metro map meetups. And what those are is they're framed, right? The initial stuff is to get people familiar with terminology um, yeah. with, with, with regard to the freedmen community, right? Like when I say things like Dawes card, it's not like, what's that? A car, okay. where do you get it, right? Okay. Um, and then from there, it's um, every every time we meet, we discuss a different aspect of Freedman history. And then now we're in the place where we're doing a lot around storytelling. What's a good story? What? Um, how do you find that? How do you find the best parts of it? And then how do you choose what medium to tell it through? And then empowering people to actually put something together revolving around that story. Wow. That's very, that's very unique approach. You, as you said, you know, it's, it's not what I've seen in this space. And so if people want to get connected with the collective, where, where do they go to find out more information and to read this perfectly crafted statement of your purpose? <laughs> where do they go? Okay. Yeah. Okayfriedman.org. 
Okay. And we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and we're on Instagram. So you can follow us on all the social media programs and we're on YouTube as well. Okay. Um, and again, it's, it's we're, we're in the business of, of really empowering people who are descendants of freedmen or who even think they might have ties and are not sure to, sure. to discover or to just tell the stories because they're, they're, they, are, they are wide and broad and amazing. Awesome. Well, okfriedman.org. And hopefully we put in the chat and comments um, on Facebook Live the, the URLs for the other organizations. I know Rick's mentioned a couple. One, I don't know if you have your website ready because you're going to do the soft launch later tonight. But um, obviously with the museum, we, we've talked about that. So CAGS, we want to talk about CAGS. And, and I just want to let our viewers know we, we've been getting some good questions. Actually, Panos, we got some good questions. We're going to pivot after after uh, Marie kind of talks a little bit about CAGS and answer a couple of these questions, because these are the questions we get all the time. So so first, Marie, will you tell us a little bit more about CAGS and how frequently you you meet? You said you've gone virtual. You, you talked about kind of how in terms of it's all California, but but you're really localized in a certain area. Kind of tell us a little bit more about about CAGS. Well, uh, we were founded in March of uh, 1986, and one of the founders was uh, Lonnie Bunch, the third, mm. because when he was here, uh, I guess the uh, director for the California African American Museum was right. in the Exposition Park. And so right, he's, right, he right. was one of the founders. And um, like everyone else, they were inspired by Alex Haley and Roots, mm -hmm. finding your, finding who you are. And uh, I think we've all touched on it a little bit. Uh, you, sometimes you don't, you, well, you don't know where you're going or where you should go until you find out who you are. What is your foundation? Mm -hmm. And uh, as the California African American Genealogical Society, we try and help people get that foundation, okay. uh, show them uh, there's more to them and their families than maybe they even realize, they don't know. So we have, uh, I've mentioned the uh, DNA interest group, we have a writer's group. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we are trying to get people to write down their stories because uh, it's, you know, we are a people of griots, mm -hmm. but we all know that in America, if it's not written down, you lose it. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to, we started the, uh, the um, writers group and encouraging people to at least start writing little stories. And we're working up from that and I must say that, uh, Nika, I have watched many of your Progen uh, videos, uh, watched you on YouTube. And uh, as far as the uh, International African American Museum, Tony, I have uh, made a modest donation and I've encouraged my members. Uh, I try every, we meet on the third Saturdays of a month, except for July and August. And I have encouraged my members to also make a donations to the to the upcoming museum. Awesome! See the love that's all here. I I love this. This uh, I, I you know Tony talked about it earlier about the sense of community and the sense of help, and we're coming together. And, and the, you know we we've got our viewers that have come together to learn some things. And so one of the questions I, I want to ask it's actually two questions, and it's the same side of the the same issue. It's different sides of the same issue. Right. So one viewer asks, I've unfortunately discovered the horror of my family having owned Africans that they enslaved, that my people enslaved people. What do I do with that information to make sure the descendants of the enslaved have an opportunity to connect with their family? So that's one side of it. The other side of it is I recently found out my people are enslaved. And it's and it's painful and it hurts. How do I deal with that? Okay, so I want to I want to just spend a few moments 
as we kind of we're getting towards the end of our, our time together, but I just want to explore those two questions. So maybe I'll ask ask one of you to talk about, you know, or two of you to talk about one side and two of you talk about the other, if that's if that's okay. So so I'm gonna, Marie, I'm gonna come back to you. If you've discovered that your family was enslaved and it's and it's painful to you, how do you process that? Or what what advice would you give to to this person who's asking this question? Well, I, I look at it as you came from strong people. You mm -hmm. came from very, you came from people who survived. You are here. And that has to say something about your heart, your foundation, and the people that you came from. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. um, I knew my great grandmother, she was born in November of 1870. Uh, she died when I was um, 12. I'm getting a little older. Really. I, I, I think she died in 1960. So, um, so I was 13. So I look at it and she talked about, she was born right after slavery, but she talked about her parents and she always told me, we are survivors. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. I, I can look at it as hurt. I can look at it as something, as a weight. But no, it's something to me that lifts me up every day that I get up. That's okay. the way I look at it. Okay. Rick, what, what would you say also to this individual? Well, again, I look at stuff from a historical and a genealogical perspective. Um, slavery was our nation's original sin. And even today, we're still suffering um, the after effects of our nation's original sin. Um, so he asked a two-part question, so I'd like to respond to it from my perspective Please do. in those two ways. Um, he had um, um, European ancestry who were enslavers. Mm -hmm. um, one, since this is a genealogy discussion, not a history discussion, he may want to, to do some genealogical research on the white ancestry, um, because that may shed some very critical light in terms of who his enslaved uh, ancestors may have been. Mm -hmm. um, most of us who have mixed heritage um, are not fortunate enough to, to, to know a lot of our black ancestry because it's hidden within those enslaved stories. Mm, um, okay. So it's, it's important to, I don't want to use the word embrace because that sounds maybe to some people condescending. So, mm. you know, it's like a rapist. You can't really embrace the, the, their abuser. Um, but, but that research may shed some light on the family. Okay. The second part of that answer is that he has enslaved ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, and I know myself, I have free ancestors and I have enslaved ancestors. And the stories of my enslaved ancestors were phenomenal stories that just, as I look today upon the challenges that they went through, how they had to persevere, how their families were taken apart, how they were ripped apart from one another. Um, it really is an opportunity to embrace their, their, their memories in terms of the challenges that they went through and I think that's what makes us so strong today. And I mm -hmm. think we have to, to, to really embrace the strength that they had to go through to just survive on a daily basis. And then not only <laughs> did they survive, they wanted to make sure that they provided a better opportunity, um, a better path for their descendants. And I think that's why many of us are where we are today because of their perseverance, through their struggles, through their challenges. So it, it really is an opportunity to really try to understand um, your enslaved ancestors and how important that they are to the very fabric of today. And you can't help but, but have pride in that. Um, so I think it's important to understand that their pain, that their suffering, that their challenges really needs to be rewritten so light can be shed on their importance to American history. So we need to embrace that 
um, and, and feel proud about that and really teach that message for the next generation. Amen. Thank you. There are so many positive comments coming through the chat, the, the comments now on Facebook on that topic. And, and you know, if what I, if I can replay what I think I heard both of you say is, is really embrace, be proud of, you know, for this one, the, the question specifically was one of their friends doesn't want to get involved in African-American ancestry because they're afraid they're going to find enslaved people. And, and there's no shame in knowing that your people are enslaved. In fact, what you said is there needs to be pride and knowing how they persevered in their strength, right? Yes. And so the other side of that question that I pose, now I'll, I'll come to Nika first and then to Tony. And talk, is, talk, if, talk, just yeah. one more thing. Rick, pop in. And there's, and there's another part to that. Um, and as you know, Tom, a lot of times I attend conferences and meetings and so many European Americans come up to us and they whisper, I had my DNA test done and I found out I have oh, African yeah. ancestry in me. So there's a, there's a flip side to that. Um, uh -huh. And they're, you know, according to some numbers, 20 to 40 million European Americans have African ancestry in them. So there's another side to that. There's another piece to that. And I would argue that the same holds true that, you know, embrace it, honor it, respect it, cherish it, and understand the struggles that happened five, 10, six generations ago. Um, and that helped us make who we are today. So there's a flip side to that as well. So I think it's important that we don't hide it, we don't walk away from it, and we certainly should not be ashamed of it. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you kind of adding that little con you know, bit of context as well. So the, the question is, if you found out that your family, let's say that, that you're European American and you find that your family enslaved Black Americans, what, what should you do about with that information? Where do you put that kind of stuff? How do you help? those who are descendants of the enslaved find their own people. So Nika and then Tony, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think a lot of this, um, a lot of the discussion is, is absolutely right, right on point. And I think, especially with, with slaveholders descendants, and we, again, we have to reframe this conversation. You know, literally earlier today, I was like, everything we learned about slavery was wrong. Like, once you start getting into genealogy and you start learning nuance about our history, you pretty much so much of the trajectory of what we were taught in school is like, but, you know, like literally there could have been a woman in your classroom doing that saying, mm, no, that wasn't all that way. Right. And in some ways it was kind of, it was done that way because it was age appropriate, right? Like what is appropriate to teach children about this particularly tough subject? Mm -hmm. So in that vein, um, the more information people have, the better. So if you are a descendant of, 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 of enslavers, you could be black or you could be white. Let's let's also add context mm -hmm. around sure. that. OK, okay. okay. Um, mm -hmm. your job is to whatever information you have is to make it widely available. A lot of times um, descendants of enslaved have no clues. They have nothing to go on, but you know that there's a Bible or a set of documents sitting in your basement or your attic that everyone in your family has hidden and tucked away because this is a stain on our name and we don't want anyone to know about this, right? right. And so just as, as you may have a home that you know served as a location where people who were enslaved worked there, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you rent your house out for weddings and you know it was a working plantation, but you've made a deliberate choice not to tell the stories of those enslaved people who worked mm -hmm. that land, right? The more transparent we are in these scenarios, the absolute better it is because you could be holding on to the key of people getting back to, to quote you earlier, that marrow deep yearning Mm -hmm. to know who their people are right mm -hmm. and so you don't want to be the cure for that cancer that is that was slavery and you're willingly holding back the cure because of your own personal shame and guilt okay. so in my opinion be transparent on the other side look this is one of those roller coasters that if you know my six-year-old son was like come on mommy we're gonna get on it and i'm like i don't want to go <laughs> slavery is a roller coaster research wise you're gonna have peaks and valleys you're gonna have celebrations you're going to have tearful fits you're gonna be mad you're gonna put it to the side but we are the thread that holds those stars and stripes together in that flag 
mm. where it's not altogether clear when you see it flying in the sky that there is thread that holds all those things together. That is literally our role. We are a reflection. We are a mirror into the history of this country. And pretty much every atrocity that has been committed against people, Black folks stand proxy and say, look, I'm here and we are a mirror. So wow. stand in your mirror status, wow. right? Like walk in that. Be confident. Know that that again, the flag does not stay together without the thread, and we are the thread. Nika, hey, John, can I add something to Rick, that, that, that? Please. And Nika, and Nika is so right because many of those um, um, slaveholder families may hold slave logs, they may hold manifests, um, they may hold records that would help bring closure. Also, and she mentioned the plantations, a lot of those plantations had cemeteries on them. And that helps heal mm, mm, for mm. many people to know that their ancestors were buried on a plot of land and they can go to that plot of land and at least pay a, a memorial service or homage to their ancestors. So there's so many things that can be done right to help heal of the broken hearts of families who were ripped apart. So I think Nick is absolutely right. So I, I just had to add that. I'm sorry. A amen. And, and hopefully somebody caught that quote about the three <laughs> and put that in, in the comments. And Tony, I want to let you get in on this as well about, again, if you, if you are the descendant of an enslaver and you've got information on enslaved people, what do you do with it? How do you, you know, how, how do you, you know, I think share Nikki is that it. You, share it. Okay, simple. Share let me it. let you talk. Go ahead. Share it. The first thing I would say is um, it's, uh, I can't tell you how many times I'm asked this question and how many communications I get of this nature. I have just learned in horror that my ancestor enslaved people. Um, and uh, I would say acknowledge that. I had one time a communication from uh, someone who's now a dear friend, who's a, a, a member of a, a prominent um, former slaveholding family here in Charleston who approached me and said, I have had a DNA descendant come to me mm. and give me evidence that uh, he is related to my family. What should I do? And I said, well, the first thing I would do is invite him to the family reunion and invite him to bring photos of his family, invite him to be prepared to share about his family's history. If, if he's separated um, geographically, um, learn a bit about his family's life, where they live now, and mm -hmm. um, et cetera. And so he did. And this young man did come and uh, everyone was enriched by that experience. So uh, the second thing I would say is um, once you get past that sort of shock that you mm -hmm. realize that your family actually were a part of America's original sin, you know, um, that can be something really that takes some time to process. Um, but once you do, I suggest that you share uh, widely all of the information you have, because as Nika and Rick pointed out, so many of the really important records that were made during the period of enslavement were actually made by the family mm -hmm. uh, who held an enslaved community, and it's in their Bibles. It's, it's in family correspondence. It's in mm -hmm. all those papers who are in the, that are in the attic or, as Nika said, sometimes in the basement. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, the internet has such a reach and Facebook has such a reach that uh, I would say go to some of the many Facebook African-American research groups, such as Our Black Ancestry, such as I've traced my ancestors' uh, my enslaved ancestors and their slaveholders, et cetera, and share that information in those groups. Um, yeah. I think that you will find that you will not be met with hostility, uh, that you will not be met with anger. I believe that you will be met with open arms and with gratitude because you may be sharing, as Nika and Rick both point out, just that very record that's going to put those pieces together for that person. Amen. Thank can you. I, can I also add to, um, we did a show on this for Black Pro Gen Live, and that's something that I constantly send people back to because we had a descendant of the slaveholding family and a descendant of the enslaved, and they talked very practically about how they nurtured that relationship and how it wasn't all pretty at the beginning and how there were barriers 
when when you know when um he initially came and was like look i have it. like all the stuff we're saying he did it and there was still like mm, i don't know should i trust you right. and the fact that we we can't assume that it's going to be microwave right just the same way as we talked about earlier with interviewing your your relatives you want to build those relationships you want you want to be on speed dial with those people that are going to give you information and then with these more complicated ones you've got to build trust right because yep, yep, the enslaved yep. descendant is like i don't trust you you yep. own my people and then the the, the enslavers family is like I, look, we all your people, but I don't want nobody to know. You know, there's a whole lot of like there back is. and forth there where is. you just have to, um, for, you just have to blindly trust and you've got to allow people to be noble and honorable or prove to you that you're, that they're not. But right. again, Tomlin Polite, um, um, Ed Ball, they were incredible yep. at how candid they were. It's the end and the episode is called Connecting with the Slaveholders um, Descendant. Was Ed Ball, was that, was he on? Was that, yeah, that's yeah, who okay. that was think, who was on the show. I think I saw that yeah. that episode. So, thank you so much. We're gonna wind down now. Um, this has been too energizing, and I know we can all keep going on and on and on. Once we get kind of going, the energy's flowing. I'm hearing that you know through the comments, the great energy and and great information that we're providing. I want to you know give a, give you a chance to give a shout out for anything that maybe your organization or you personally are doing for Black History Month. This is Black History Month. My shameless plug is Roots Tech Connect, February 25th through the 27th. <laughs> Virtual, go to rootstech.org and uh, and get uh, free access to tons of content that we're, we're giving to help people do African-American research. But each of you are involved in organizations that are doing things to either tribute or have done things this month to pay tribute for Black History Month. So so Marie, anything that, that CAGS has done or that you plan to do for Black History Month as we kind of end today that you wanna share with people? Well, we are constantly posting things. We do have a Facebook page, uh, uh, Facebook slash um, California African-American Genealogical Society. Okay. Uh, our website is CAGS, C-A-A-G-S dot O-R-G. Okay. Our meeting, uh, is um, what's the third the third Saturday, which is next 20th. Saturday, which will be the twentieth mm -hmm. at uh, ten a.m. in the morning. Um, we usually have uh, if we have anyone that wants to take a beginner's class, we do have that. We have an intermediate class, and this month Charlotte Bocage will be our uh, presenter. And since we have so many people. Uh, that are members of our society who are from Louisiana. She will be, and I, I, uh, <laughs> I don't remember the title of her presentation, but it will have to, it will be doing researching. It has to do with researching uh, your ancestors in uh, Louisiana. And, you know, and we have, uh, we have that. Um, so that's about it right now. Um, next Great. month, we will be doing a little bit something special for to honor our um, anniversary okay. uh, which will be our uh, third Saturday in uh, the month of March okay. so that's about it okay but I, I've enjoyed this discussion and I have like I said I uh, uh, lead people or direct people to family search uh, also to uh, black progen uh, live to, and I have uh, to augs and, and uh, to the uh, uh, museum that's coming in uh, South Carolina. So I'm looking forward to all of that. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Nika, anything that you, you, you've involved in a lot. I saw a press release earlier or yesterday about some, a new thing that you're involved in with questions and stuff like that. But, but I don't know if that's launching during Black History Month or not, or what, what you're doing for Black History Month yourself or Black Progen or any of the organizations? What, what you got on tap? Yeah, so for the collective, we already met. Um, we had a meeting on the 6th, so it was just last weekend. But for um, March 6th, we're actually going into um, directing our efforts towards storytelling types. 
Are you someone who likes audio? Are you someone who likes video? Do you like to write? And then we're going to have people join a team so that they have a support around the ancestor story of choice that they've decided to tell during our showcase, which is gonna happen on April the 3rd. Um, tonight, actually, in literally two hours, Black Pro Gen Live will be having episode 128 that is all about the national ex-slave pension movement, which a lot of people do not know about. There were bills and all kinds of stuff that were set up um, to establish pensions for the formerly enslaved that were based off of Civil War pensions for veterans of the Civil War. So we're going to be doing a deep dive into that tonight. Um, we'll also have um, an episode at the end of the month that's going to be a premiere where we're going to be talking about just literally answering the question, is it possible to trace back to Africa, both on paper and through DNA? And okay. where the panel okay. weighs in on what the challenges are to do either. Okay, great. Rick, what about AUGS? Any, anything in, in AUGS or, or you have, obviously you announced this, this new group that's yeah. formed. Um, for those who have enslaved ancestors and they want to honor them, um, certainly uh, go to the website of the Sons and Daughters of the United States Middle Passage. Uh, their conference is in May. Um, it's a phenomenal opportunity to learn how to do um, research on enslaved ancestors, how to honor your enslaved ancestors. And Dr. Evelyn McDowell is a phenomenal person. AUGS has its conference in October. Um, it's training, education, collaboration, research, um, theory. Um, so you really want to reach out to uh, Gene Stevenson at, um, uh, as president uh, at aahgs.org. Um, so AUGS is a phenomenal organization. We have chapter presidents from all around the country. And some of the stuff that, that, that the organization is doing is absolutely phenomenal. We're now doing international stuff. So we're really doing some great phenomenal things. And those of you who are really interested in how we as, a, as Americans help found the country, build the country, develop the country, stay tuned. Um, we will have a hard launch and announcement um, in May on the Society of the First Africans, uh, First Africans in uh, English America. You'll notice I refer to as English America um, because, because we are the founders before it became the United States of America. So there'll be a lot done on that. Um, I'm really excited about that. And I think as more and more people hear about it, um, we'll actually be helping people make the connections to their ancestors. So there's a lot of things that we're going to do um, through DNA, through genealogy, through paper, you name it. So I think, um, and since they say that 70% of us are related through DNA, then most of us will be able to be, uh, become members of this lineage society and learn from one another in the history of our ancestors. Great, thank you. And we'll put, for viewers, we will put links. I know there was a question about CAGS and their event coming up on Saturday the 20th. So we'll put a link to that, um, to CAGS.org where you can uh, learn more and, and see how you can connect with that event. Um, we're sorry that we hadn't been able to answer all the questions that have come in. Nika, there's a question specifically for you in the chat on the Freedmen's Bureau uh, that someone has a question about. And so um, they, they wanted to know if you might have a chance to go after this and, and answer that question specifically. Um, I want to give Tony a chance to talk about some things that, that you're doing for Black History Month. I know you've got a big virtual uh, event happening. I know the museum is not functioning yet. It's being built and constructed, but the Center for Family History is thriving with lots of, you know, you've been thriving for a long time, a collection of resources and, and blogs and tutorials and all those kinds of things. What do you got coming up for us for Black History Month as we kind of end today's program? Oh, yes, we're dead serious around here. Um, never, <laughs> never a dull moment. We have so many things going on. Um, the first thing that I'd like for everyone to know is that the wonderful Angela Walton Raji uh, will be blogging for us on our uh, family history research blog. And in fact, we're going to introduce her next week. And her series of blog posts going forward will be about beginning and basic African-American genealogy to help people get a really solid foundation in the basics of African-American genealogy. Um, the second thing that we have going on is that um, we recently completed our very first, um, and this is also a soft 
announcement. We recently very completed our very first exhibit on the Google Arts and Culture platform that will be coming out soon, where we tell the story of a local uh, farming and fishing uh, community, uh, Salagri community, and a fraternal organization lodge that served that community back in the early um, 20th century and how when that lodge fell into disrepair, the community that it once served came together to save it and actually did and did a remarkable um, uh, job in the, and the lodge is now serves as a museum. And then finally, we are participating quite a bit in Roots Tech Connect. Um, we have, uh, you'll be able to watch a preview of the museum that our COO, Elijah Hayward uh, recorded that gives you a little bit of a tour of the museum, just tells you about the values of the museum and what to expect. Um, and then we have a five part short video series called Pilot Spies and Soldiers, How African Americans Turned the Tide of the Civil War, where mm -hmm. we take you into individual stories of um, how African Americans um, were active agents in assuring a union victory in the Civil War and the enormous risks that they took in order to assure those ends. Um, so that's awesome. Um, also, uh, I'll be presenting two sessions at Roots Tech, one with Bernice Bennett about uh, United States Colored Troops pension files and another one with Shelley Murphy, uh, where we are going to SWAT analyze an obituary. So we're gonna take an obituary raw and we're going to say what, what information is in here and where can we go from there and where might those records lead us. Wow, so Tony, you, do you sleep? <laughs> sure well, rarely right now uh, because it's February. So I, wow. I'm going to say yeah. rarely. We I had a 40 all, minute nap today. So <laughs> we are all very busy. Um, and I want to just take time to thank you and honor you, our panelists. We have Marie Bryant, the president of the California African American Genealogical Society, Tony Carrier, the director of the Center for Family History at the International African American Museum, Rick Murphy, former vice president of history for the Afro American Historical and Genealogical Society, and Nika Smith. Uh, there's too many titles to say, but representing the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective today. Uh, I'm so glad you were here. So much information. I know so many people want to get in contact with you. So we've put a lot of links in, uh, in the chat on, on Facebook and, and, you know, people can replay this on YouTube and hopefully get that information as well and, and connect with you on various social media sites and things like that. Again, on behalf of Family Search. Uh, and, and all of those who are viewers today who joined us, thank our panelists for this great time, great energy. I love being with you. You all stay on. We're going to stop our, our live broadcast. So thank you. Every, everybody wave. How about all of us wave? 